I don't want to grow up, I'm a curious kid The world has a hundred questions I can play with So I'll open my arms and eyes And wonder every day till the day I die Dr. Chris McKay is Senior Planetary Scientist at NASA Ames Research Center down in Mountain View, where he has contributed to the Mars Phoenix Lander, the Mars Science Laboratory, and the Huygens probe to Saturn's moon Titan. Dr. McKay earned his PhD in astrogeophysics, covering all the ground there, astrogeophysics from the University of Colorado. His research in extreme environments has led him to places like Antarctica, very northern Canada, and Chile's Atacama Desert. He has earned the U.S. Antarctic Service Medal, the NASA Exceptional Leadership Medal, and the NASA Presidential Rank Award. Over the last 20 years, Dr. McKay has been a Wonderfest speaker more than any other scientist. We are enormously ha happy to have him with Wonderfest and with the Cal Academy and with you tonight. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Chris McKay. Thanks, thanks, Tucker. I want to put in a plug for Wonderfest because, as Tucker said, it's been going on for 20 years. And I'm always happy to be involved because it's just such a great way to take science out into the community and share with what we're doing. So uh, I can't imagine how much time and effort Tucker puts into organizing these events. All I have to do is show up and talk. And that's the easy bit. Uh, so tonight, what I'm going to show up and talk about is following up on Pascal's terrific talk uh, with a theme about life and Mars. Uh, Tucker asked me to, to, to look in the long-term future, uh, long-term future of Mars. And to me, the long-term future of Mars is wrapped up into the question of life. So I want to talk about life on Mars. Uh, and I titled the talk, Biology, Humans, and Terraforming. Uh, and in some sense, this is past, present, and future. Uh, and, and in fact, that's a good way to start by framing the question of life on Mars as three questions. One about life in the past. Did Mars have life? Was it a second genesis? And as Pascal said in his talk, this is the science driver that sends missions to Mars. It's this question of life, and in particular, second genesis. Is it different life than life on Earth? The second question is, Life present. Can Mars support life? Is it a place where humans can live and work? And we all sort of assume that the answer to that question is yes. We just have to figure out how. But uh, one of the issues with that answer is, is there life there? If the answer to this is yes, there was life, it's still there, and it is a second genesis. They really are aliens. Doesn't that influence this? Right? Uh, and finally, flowing down to the future, can Mars have a biological future? So these are the, these are the three questions that I'm interested in personally. Uh, and uh, they're woven together, and I'm going to try to pick them apart and talk about how, they, how we're making progress on them, what our understanding is, and how they motivate our investigations of Mars. So, uh, this is a slide that shows again what Pascal showed, the tree of life. Uh, this is all life on Earth. Everything you had for breakfast and lunch and most of the food in the cafeteria here is all sourced from this tree of life. Same DNA, same RNA, same 20 um, amino acids and proteins, et cetera. There's only one type of life on Earth. What we're looking for, science-wise, is a second type of life. We're looking for something not on our tree of life. That is the definition of an alien, something not on the tree of life. This is an interesting little side point. When I was a kid, many, many, many years ago, aliens were defined geographically. If you were an alien, you were from another planet. If you were from another planet, you were an alien. It's a geographical definition. Now, we realize that material can exchange between planets. It's not a useful definition. We define aliens biochemically. So, NASA defines aliens biochemically. If you're on our tree of life, if you live on Mars, you're still not an alien. You're part of our tree of life, right? There are still some parts of the federal government that define aliens geographically, but NASA's beyond that. Uh, 
So an alien, then, is anything not on our tree of life. That's a useful definition because it tells us what we're looking for. And as Pascal pointed out, it means that fossils won't do. We have to actually find the body of an organism. It can be dead, but we have to have its biochemistry intact. In fact, it's somewhat preferable if it's dead because then we don't have to worry about planetary protection and quarantine and things like that. And, and you have to kill it to do the kind of analysis we want to do to determine if it's on our tree of life anyway. So that's an important practical point for Mars. Frozen dead organisms are good for this study too. And, and here's why if we had another type of life, we could do comparative biochemistry, uh, another example of life. And we'd also know life is common in the universe. My little editorial point there, yay. It would be good to know that life is common in the universe. We would have two examples right here in our solar system. And by the famous 0-1 infinity rule, that would mean there's a in virtually infinite number of life out there. If you don't know what the 0-1 infinity rule is, Google it. It's a, it's a theorem that the only numbers that make sense are 0, 1, and infinity. Uh, and it was really first articulated by Isaac Asimov in his wonderful book, The Gods Themselves. And he was talking about gods. There could be zero gods, there could be one god, there could be an infinite number of gods, but there's not going to be 33 gods or 12 gods. Right? And I think you can make the same case for life in the universe. Uh, so the second big question is illustrated in this picture, uh, humans on Mars. Can we really do this? Can we really set up a base? Uh, can we live and work? Is Mars a place where humans can live and work? The two big issues, uh, this has gotten a lot of press lately uh, as Elon Musk and the movie The Martian and other events have triggered public interest. When reporters ask me, is this really possible? I'd say there's two big questions that tend to get overlooked in the discussion. One is the one-third gravity. Mars has only got one-third gravity. We don't know what the long-term effects of that are on human beings and adults, much less children, much less uh, 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 childbirth and development. The other big question is life. Does this plan alter if we know that there's organisms in the soil uh, that are alive, maybe even dangerous? Right? Uh, we, don't, we don't think there's any in the soil, but we don't know that for a fact. We don't think one-third gravity is a problem, but we don't have any data to support that. The third big question is the future. Uh, borrowing from the modern jargon, can we make Mars great again? Right? We have evidence that Mars once had water, uh, lots of water. Uh, we think that when it had water, it had life. Uh, we have some understanding of why it went bad. Could we bring it back up? It, as I'll get to later, the fundamental challenge in warming up Mars or making Mars habitable is warming it up. And that's a technology that we have mastered. We know how to warm up planets. We have demonstrated it on Earth. Right? So indeed, we are capable of doing this. It's a surprise, uh, and, but we'll come to that. So those are the three big themes that I want to talk about. Search for a second genesis, humans to Mars from a biological perspective, from a point of view of their interaction with the life that's there. And finally, the biological future. Uh, what's the roadmap for making Mars a planet full of life again? Uh, so here is the one slide story of why if Mars used to look like this, why doesn't it look like it anymore? Uh, it's because Mars is one-tenth the mass of the Sun, of the Earth, sorry. It's one-tenth the mass of the Earth. It's smaller. Here the planets are shown to scale. Mars three and a half billion years ago, Earth no, because it's smaller, it has no plate tectonics, less gravity, and no magnetic field. All of those factors cause it to lose its atmosphere. Lose its atmosphere, becomes cold, freezes up, and it becomes a desert world we see today. So we have a story as to why Mars died. It took a long time to die. This will come back later and when we think about bringing it back to life. It took several hundred million years to die from this state. Uh, which is a brief period of time looking backwards in Martian history, but it's a long time looking forward in human history. Uh, so let's talk a little bit now about the search for life. Where could, is it possible that in near term time frame we will find evidence of life on Mars and even determine whether it is or is not 
a second genesis, if it's alien. Uh, two missions of recent uh, times point toward directions where we might continue and maybe if we could get a deeper drill to Mars, in a decade or two, we might, if we're lucky, have an answer. Curiosity, the rover which landed on Mars in 2012, went to this site uh, in the bottom of Gale Crater, Yellowknife Bay. This picture is one of my favorite pictures of Mar from Mars because it, it, it looks so familiar. You could imagine this scene on the side of the road, driving I-15 in Southern California, from, uh, approaching Las Vegas and then you turn around and go the other way anyway. You, you see this kind of uh, sandstone, mudstone with mountains in the distance and then some haze and then some mountains in the further distance. Mars looks familiar to us. It's much more so than any of the other worlds in our solar system. The moon with its black and whites and sharp contrasts and Europa and Enceladus, those are interesting worlds and we should explore them, Titan, but none of them look so much like home the way Mars does. And I think these landscapes is why Mars calls to the human imagination more than any other world. This site, Yellowknife Bay, is my favorite spot on Mars because it's also the best place to search for evidence of life. Uh, it is a big giant crater that filled with water three and a half billion years ago. Uh, this is an artist's conception, obviously. I can never get the artists to put ice in the picture. You may have noticed back in this picture of early Mars, it looks very warm. There's no ice anywhere. You see ice on Earth, here's Antarctica. You don't see ice, very much ice on Mars. But it was cold back then, so I, I always have to Photoshop in the ice myself. <laughs> so this is what it would have looked like, ice-covered lakes. And that's why, as Pascal pointed out, we go to the polar regions on Earth to find analogs for these places. And what we were driving on, what we are driving on with Rover, the rover, Curiosity, are mudstones that were deposited on the bottom of this ice-covered lake. So think of a lake, think of ice on the top of it, water, and then stuff coming down to the bottom like always does on lakes, mud, 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 getting compacted into mudstone. And we are looking at that mudstone now. This is, this for me was extremely exciting. Uh, most of the rocks we've seen on every other mission on Mars have been volcanic rocks. Only a geologist could like a volcanic rock. If you're interested in life, sedimentary rocks, mudstones, are much, much more interesting. And here they are for the first time on Mars. And this is particularly interesting to me because we can point to places on Earth that are models of what this lake would have been like billions of years ago. Here it is, an ice-covered lake in the Antarctic Nothing is growing on the shores. It's lifeless, uh, ice covered, and water under the ice. This is our camp at that lake a few years ago. Uh, I'll just point out a few points of interest. This is the restroom. And you can see uh, we are way ahead of that gender debate over who can use the restroom. Uh, <laughs> and in true Bay Area style, it's available for use by anyone. Uh, and it is an important point that we collect and carry out all of our waste human waste, uh, drinking water, uh, cleaning water, every single bit of organic material that we bring with us, we take back out because of the uh, extreme low nutrient level in this lake. The amount of organic material in our camp uh, would be a significant perturbation to the ecology of the lake. Uh, I'm getting ahead of my story, but what we, we did at this site, which is an interesting parallel to exploration, uh, we, we weren't the first science team to come to this lake. There are maybe three or four ahead of us over the last 30 years. But we were the first science team to go into the lake, cut a hole in the lake and send a diver down. This is the first diver to enter that lake ever, Dale Anderson, the PI of our team. And, it, and when I thought about it, I realized he's not just the first diver, he's the first vertebrate to enter that lake ever in history. And this is me there. I think what I'm saying is, Dale, just wait there for a minute. We're going to go get a coffee, and we'll be right back. Uh, and then here I am a, couple, a day later going down into the same water. Uh, why are we going in this lake? Uh, remember that the shore of this lake is completely lifeless. Uh, it's cold. It's dry. This is the middle of Antarctica. Uh, there's nothing there. This ice in this lake is about as thick as this building. We go down these tunnels because underneath this ice, in this otherwise lifeless environment, 
there are huge mounds of microorganisms growing, about 30 meters high, forming mounds. There's no fish, no uh, amphibians, nothing that's macroscopic, only microscopic life growing on the bottom of this lake. And what, what really amazed me, it's kind of a deep level, is no one had ever seen this before. Now, okay, it's just a small little science nerd corner of the world, but I just thought it was really cool, literally and figuratively, to be in this water and to see something that no one had ever seen before and to realize that this could have been Mars three and a half billion years ago and it could have been this lake three and a half billion years ago. So when we were drilling into this material, I was extremely excited. I was promising that we would see all sorts of brown, black, gooey stuff right below the surface. And we did see black, gooey stuff, but it had no organics in it. And apparently, cosmic radiation is destroying the organics in the top few meters of the Mars surface. And so to get to the leftovers of these microorganisms, which I just can feel they really were there on Mars, right? They're buried in this mudstone. We're going to have to drill five meters or so. And we might actually find their frozen, preserved organic remains. Think of the woolly mammoths frozen in the Siberian permafrost. Those organisms are long dead, but you can pull out their cells and you can sequence their DNA. You could even, in principle, clone and reconstruct them. Uh, so dead and frozen is not really dead. Now, don't try this at home, but dead and frozen is not really dead. On Mars, the organisms could be dead and frozen, and we could still recover them and learn about their biochemistry and maybe even recover them back to life. Uh, because dead and frozen, particularly for microorganisms, is not dead. In fact, that's the way the uh, American Type Culture Collection ships microorganisms. If you order a microorganism from it, they send it to you freeze-dried, a process that would kill any larger organism, and effectively it kills the microorganisms, but you can resurrect them by just adding water. Uh, the other site on Mars which promises to hold evidence of life is the Phoenix site mission in 2008 in the polar regions, dug down, found ice in the ground, uh, just a few meters below the ground, and going to places again in Antarctica with Mars-like dirt and ice, we can study how life can survive in these conditions. So it might be that at this site, in the polar regions of Mars, we will find organisms in the ice that are preserved. Phoenix had a scoop, as you see here, it could reach the ice, but couldn't get into it. So in both Curiosity site and at the Phoenix site, the key to finding the remains of the Martians is drilling underground. And I'll just point out that drilling is one of the things that humans are very good at. So when Pascal and his team go to the Antar uh, Mars and they say, well, what should we do? Uh, I say, drill. Drill, baby, drill. Right? Uh, and that's a bipartisan drill, baby, drill. Right? Uh, so let's go back to the vision of a big base on Mars with humans there, exploring, searching for evidence of life. The first thing that comes to mind, the first question is, whoa, there's something wrong with this picture. Don't send humans to Mars because they will contaminate Mars before we have a chance to determine if it has life or its potential for life. This is a valid concern. Uh, you cannot send humans to Mars in a way that will not carry with them other microorganisms. You can't sterilize humans. Uh, and there is a faulty impression that we sterilize our robotic spacecraft. But in fact, we don't. Uh, we have already contaminated Mars. In July 4th, 1997, something like 300,000 Earthlings landed on Mars in one invasion force. Most of them were killed right away from the lethal UV radiation. But the ones that were inside the rover, shielded from the UV, are still alive to this day. They're not doing anything. They're dormant, uh, but they're viable. Uh, that was the first time, the first non-sterile spacecraft sent to Mars. The two Viking missions and all the previous Russian missions had to follow international rules that required sterilization. This was the first non-sterilized one. It's been followed by a lot of others. Spirit and Rover, 10 to the 5th, Phoenix, which was a joint, which was US mission, but had a Canadian instrument on it. So there's Canadian microbes on Mars too. You can tell the Canadian microbes because they're more polite than the US <laughs> microbes, but they're there too. 
Uh, Beagle, bunch of Brits, and Curiosity carried the most ever, 278,000 bacteria are known to have been on that spacecraft. You add it all up, and there are right now on Mars about half a million alive, viable, they're alive, but they're not growing, viable Earthlings. So we've already contaminated Mars. So the concern about humans is still valid, but that concern has to be treated with the reality that that barn door has already been opened and the horse has gone out. How do we deal with the fact that we have contaminated Mars? Is this a war of the worlds? Is this a big problem? Or is there some solution here? Well, uh, the solution rests on what you think about microbial life. If we find life on Mars and it's a second genesis, it's almost certainly going to be microbial. Uh, now, I would argue that if we find microbial life on Mars and it's a second genesis, then it represents a whole new moral category and it deserves moral consideration. So simply from ethical considerations, we should uh, respect Martian life if it's there, if it's a second genesis. Now, even if you have no ethics, and some of my friends have no ethics, particularly in the space business, then they, I would argue you should still respect Martian life because the biochemical knowledge you would gain from studying it is of such enormous utility that it's more valuable than anything else on Mars. Uh, so what does that mean for our strategy of exploration? It means we can't take a policy of no contamination. It's too late for that. But we can take a policy of reversible exploration. Uh, think of that little button on your computer, Control-Z. You do a bunch of things, and then you decide, well, that was a bad idea. Control-Z, Control-Z, Control-Z. You just undo back to where it wasn't so bad, right? Uh, wouldn't it be great if real life had a Control-Z button? Uh, I could have used it many times. But we, right now, everything we've done on Mars is reversible. We could go back and pick up that rover, pick up the landers, go to the crash sites. We can reverse the exploration. The reason we can reverse it is because nothing has grown. Normally, we think of biological contamination as irreversible. Think rabbits in Australia. Two cute little rabbits go to Australia and then you can't get rid of them, no matter what you try, because rabbits grow exponentially. So when, when life is given an environment in which it can grow, where contamination is irreversible. It's exponentially hard to reverse it. When life is put in an environment where it can't grow, it's still a contamination, but it's re reversing it becomes possible and is only linearly difficult. And this would apply to a human base as well. Everything we could do on a human base could be designed to be reversible if the humans discover or some robotic mission discovers a second genesis of life. Now, if we discover life on Mars and it's related to us by transfer of rocks or something, well, then there are our cousins. We just move right in, uh, and they'll say, what took you so long? We got here by rocks billions of years ago. But if it's a second genesis, it's a profoundly different situation. And in that case, I would argue that we reverse our contamination and Mars gets set aside for that type of life, a second planet with a second type of life. And I would argue that the value to humanity is greater because we would have another type of life to study. Think of all the things that rest on our understanding of biochemistry. My favorite is microbial infections caused by bacteria, not by archaea. Why? We don't know. That might be something we could understand if we could master the tree of life by comparing to other types of life. OK, but now let's go to the far future. Uh, Mars, as we've argued, as I've argued, suggested, has a past, a planet with a past, a warm, wet past. We think a biological past. The basis for that bio biological assumption is that Mars was Earth-like when Earth first had life. So you have two planets, Earth and Mars, both with extensive water habitats. During that time of similarity, life is found on Earth. Was it on Mars? That's the driving question of Mars science. Humans will be able to contribute that. If the answer to that question turns out to be yes, and it's a second genesis, that has profound effects for what we do in the future. Even if it turns out no, we would consider what would it take 
to bring back that loving feeling that Mars once had, right? Like the song goes, bring back that loving feeling. Is that possible? And as I said, the fundamental challenge is warming up a planet. And we know how to warm up the planets. So let me show you the pictures. This is Mars. This is Mars. Do you notice the difference? It's subtle, but it's there. It's life. Now, I put these two pictures together to illustrate a point. This Mars is very interesting, and many people really like Mars like it is. Rocks and landscapes and beautiful canyons. It would be a wonderful world to explore. There are lifeless environments on Earth. There's a few. There's, I only know of two environments on Earth where you can claim that they are effectively lifeless. Uh, the high elevation dry valleys and the ultra hyper arid region of the Atacama Desert where we have crossed an environmental threshold and they cannot support life. And they have a non-living beauty of their own and, the, and we should appreciate them that way. So Mars as it is today is not without beauty and value. Uh, and so it's kind of a hard question. Mars with life is also uh, full of beauty and value. And Kim Stanley Robinson, in his books, Red Mars, Blue Mars, Green Mars, pokes at this uh, dichotomy. You know, do, you, do you want to just let the universe be the way it is and appreciate it as a bystander? Big do not touch sign on it, like the dioramas behind the glass? Or is the universe a garden, and we are gardeners, and we're going to spread life? And life is the magic that we have, and we can spread. Okay, now, I am clearly, obviously, of the view that life is the value. And it's a value that we humans can contribute to. And it's a value that can actually grow. And our actions can make it grow. Um, and so I would argue that we do want to make Mars biologi a biological world again. And if it has its own biology, we want to enhance that biology. If it doesn't have its own biology, we share our biology. The gift from Earth is the gift of life. That may turn out to be true for the whole universe. Now, it's hard to imagine that Earth is the only planet with life in the universe. It's extremely hard to imagine. But it's not impossible that it's true, that it is a unique gift from Earth. Uh, even if it's not a unique gift in the galaxy and the universe, it may be a unique gift with respect to our solar system. And if not, if Mars does have life, dormant, a second genesis, it's not doing very well. It's not spread out in, global, in a global biosphere like life on Earth is. So we're from the government. We're here to help. Right? Uh, so I'm arguing for terraforming. And, and I have been a, uh, interested and a researcher in terraforming for many years. And interest in the topic is growing. I think it's growing for two reasons. One is people are beginning to appreciate the challenge of human management of the Earth, really. We have to stop taking a laissez-faire attitude toward the Earth and have to start engaging our intellect in the challenge of maintaining the Earth collectively. And secondly, uh, it's of interest because folks like Elon Musk are making the case that human exploration from, of Mars is closer than you think. And if you watched his presentation uh, at, in Mexico a few months ago where he announced the SpaceX bold vision for colonizing Mars, he had a projection of Mars behind him, and it slowly turned from the cold red Mars of today to this terraformed Mars. Uh, so it's, it's becoming part of the dialogue now, making Mars habitable. And, uh, and I think that's it's interesting. So as a result, I get emails. This is an email I got from an artist saying, I drew a bunch of pictures of terraforming Mars. Take a look at it. And he had three steps. First step is, uh, this is the step that Pascal was talking about. Humans are there exploring in their rovers and their spacesuits, uh, and they're setting up weather stations, and they're trying to drill down, look for life. Uh, go, go, astronauts, go. Find that life. And I, I think we're not going to, my guess is we won't find evidence of life, or we won't answer that question through science satisfaction until we send humans. 
And it's not just that humans are such good explorers, it's because we won't invest the resources necessary to answer that question until humans go. Humans going will bring a programmatic and political momentum with them, which will bring the resources necessary to do the deep drilling and the exploration necessary to answer the question. Uh, and then this is the second step. We're starting to warm up Mars. How do we warm it up? Well, we warm it up the same way we're warming up the Earth, putting greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. On Earth, it may, may or may not be a good idea, depending on which administration is elected. As a uh, member of the executive branch, I always agree with the uh, upper uh, perspective, whatever they want, all good. Uh, on Mars, it's clearly a good idea to warm up the planet and to uh, add greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. We don't really know how we'll do that. Uh, the one correction I suggested to the artist is when he first drew this, the smoke coming out of these greenhouse making factories was black. And I said, no, it wouldn't be black, because smoke is black when it has soot in it. Uh, there wouldn't be any soot here. These are just chlorofluorocarbons coming out. It'd be clear. Uh, but other than that, he's got it well represented. And then eventually, as Mars warms up, the sky turns blue, water is flowing, uh, and you've got trees from Earth and people running around. They can't breathe the air. Uh, they still got to have oxygen masks, but they don't need spacesuits, and they don't need uh, heavy coats. The pressure and temperature are suitable. Uh, that's, that's the vision in pictures. How realistic is it? Well, the fundamental question is one of energy. We have Mars today. It's cold and it's dry and it's frozen. Here is Mars warm and wet and not frozen. How much energy? Well, this is a simple physics problem. Here is state A. Here is state B. You can list the enthalpy, free energy of state A and the free energy of state B. And you can just calculate simply how much energy does it take to go from state A to state B. That is the first law of thermodynamics. And no matter how you do it, it's going to take that much energy. Then you can address, take the question one step further. What are the plausible sources of energy? Well, people like to say, well, atom bombs. That's a big source of energy. Actually, they're really quite small. If you add up all the nuclear arsenals, of the United States, the former Soviet Union, even throw in North Korea just for fun in the mix, it adds up to about half an hour of Mars sunlight. And that's it. We humans do not have direct capability to release large energy sources on a planetary scale. What we do have the capability to do is put gases in the atmosphere that trap the huge flux of solar energy coming in. And that's the only plausible way to terraform Mars or to warm up Mars. Uh, that's how we're warming up the Earth, not by directly releasing energy, but by trapping this huge flux of sunlight that comes in and out every day. Uh, well, if you just calculate how much sunlight it takes to warm Mars up with a typical efficiency of 10% for greenhouse gases, it would only take 100 years to warm it up, 100 years. So you could go from this picture to that picture in 100 years. In retrospect, that calculation is not too surprising. We are warming up the Earth right now roughly at a rate of one degree per decade. Every 10 years, the Earth is getting about one degree warmer. Right? Could carry that on for 100 years and maybe double it because you're actually trying instead of doing it accidentally. You could, you could imagine 20 degrees of warming that's enough to push Mars over the edge where it becomes a warm, wet world. So 100 years, it's possible. I can relate to 100 years. If you round off my age in decimal, I am 100 years old. I can imagine 100 years. Right? Uh, so terraforming, warming Mars more correctly. Terraforming is a word coined in science fiction, but it's not technically accurate. Warming Mars is something that we could start today, and people born today could see it completed to the extent of this sort of picture. Uh, that's, that's kind of amazing. It reminds me of a cartoon when I was a kid. Dennis the Menace and Margaret were having an argument. I forgot what the argument was about. But Dennis says to Margaret, I'm right, and I'll bet you a million dollars that I'm right. And Margaret says, oh, I'm right, and I'll bet you a nickel I'm right. And Dennis goes, a nickel? Now, you're talking real money. 
And that's the point here. A hundred years, this isn't science fiction anymore. We don't have to wait for Star Trek and antimatter and warp drive to consider whether or not to do this. This is something that we could imagine right away. Now, you could say, well, what about making it breathable for humans? That can also be done the same way. Calculate the energy required, divide by sunlight, modulo the efficiency of the biosphere for making oxygen. The answer turns out to be 100,000 years. Even I'm not that old. 100,000 years is way beyond what we can see in terms of the human event horizon. Right? 100 years, it's possible. 100,000 years is not. So we can make Mars warm and a planet for life, things like trees and organisms. We cannot make it a planet that humans can walk around simply the way they can on Earth right now because of the problem of making oxygen. Remember, it took Earth two billion years to make oxygen. Uh, if we take, it would take on Mars 100,000 years using the advanced technology of trees. Okay, uh, so this is just a, a summary of these, the point that Mars would be habitable for plants. It would not be habitable for humans directly. It would be much more pleasant than it is today, but you would still need a small source of oxygen to move around. How do we do it? Greenhouse gases. And the ones we would want to use are ones made out of fluorine. Don't use chlorine, don't use bromine. They destroy ozone. Ozone's a good thing on Earth. It'll be a good thing on Mars as well. Here's the calculation for how much we need. We don't need very much. This is something we've learned on Earth. Just small amounts of these gases at the parts per million level could go a long way to warming up a planet. <clears throat> These really are super greenhouse gases. So the, <clears throat> I want to now sort of <clears throat> edge into the sort of philosophical reasons of why view Mars through this perspective of life uh, <clears throat> and why view the future in terms of what can we do to spread life and enhance life. And I find motivation from the little prince. And th this Note this little bell jar with a rose in it, uh, plants. And when we go, we'll take our plants with us. In fact, we'll send them first. It's like you know when you're moving. If you move, <clears throat> if you're going somewhere just to visit, you don't take your plants with you. But if you take your plants with you, you know you're going to stay. Right? And that's, that's what it'll be on Mars. When we take our plants, when we send plants, then you know we're serious about staying. And we will send plants first. I will go on record as predicting that the first organism to actually grow, born, live, grow, and die on Mars will be a plant. <clears throat> Won't be a rose. Because the botanists have no sense of aesthetics at all. <clears throat> they want to they send a little tiny green mustard plant called the Rabidopsis because it's the most well-studied plant in biology. Uh, they don't like the idea of a rose. But I put the rose on anyway, uh, <clears throat> not just for the little prince, but also for this wonderful short story, which is actually a horrible short story, but it has one wonderful line in this otherwise horrible short story by Roger Slazny. And that line is, there has never been a flower on Mars, she said, but we will learn to grow them. That, to me, is an inspiring line. Oh, she is the, prince, the queen of Mars, by the way. Uh, <clears throat> don't read the short story, but get the book and just look at that line. <laughs> I find it inspiring. There's never been a flower on Mars, but we will learn to grow them. That is a symbol of the idea of restoring Mars to life. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> and more on the little prince, just the notion that <clears throat> we humans can be of use. Uh, is, uh, the last line. It is of some use to my volcanoes, and it is also of some use to my flower that I have them. To me, that is the best argument for humans taking an active role in maintaining the ecosystems, the ecologies of a planet, Mars, obviously of the Earth, too. There is some use that we can bring from the talents that we have to these kind of issues. We're not doomed to only doing bad stuff. Uh, and finally, the ultimate argument for why we should think of Mars in terms of life really is coming back to Earth and maintaining the Earth and 
the habitability of the Earth. And <clears throat> being a physics major, I have to quote Feynman. On his chalkboard when he left, it's, he wrote, what I cannot create, I do not understand. Now, he wasn't talking about Earth, but I am. To really, under, to really understand the Earth, we have to understand what it would take to create one, and Mars is a place where we can at least do the thought experiment, if not the real experiment. And then this slide is blank, or at least it was my intention to leave it blank. So, and that's my cue that it's the end of the talk. And I don't know if I've ran over time or if we still have time for some questions. All right, the question is, Mars doesn't have a magnetic field. Uh, it also has lower gravity. And we're not going to change either of those. So won't it be doomed to lose its atmosphere again? And the answer is yes. And we can calculate how fast it would lose it. Uh, even without the magnetic field due to solar wind sputtering. To, to give just a real quick technical explanation of how you do the calculation, when Mars, for those of you that have background in atmospheric science, if Mars is warmed up, we basically just increase the vertical elevation of all the current pressure levels. So the current pressure level at which gases escape is still the same pressure level, it's just as higher in the atmosphere as we've added a couple scale heights below. So it's about uh, 30 kilometers higher which has no effect at all in gravity or anything else. So it's essentially the same physics as the escape, as the exco base today, which means the escape rate doesn't change, which means Mars will lose its atmosphere in about 100 million years. Uh, the magnetic field would, would delay that somewhat, but we can't change that. That thick atmosphere would also provide adequate radiation shielding that the magnetic field wouldn't be essential for maintaining habitability. On Earth, the magnetic shield field, as Pascal pointed out, does deflect solar charged particles. Uh, it deposits them in the polar regions, creating aurora. On Mars, we would not have aurora, sad to say. Those particles would just come through and be absorbed at around uh, 80 kilometers. Uh, <clears throat> so 100 million years is all it would last. But that's a long time. That's a long time in the future. The Earth won't last much longer than that. Uh, the Earth, current estimates are, will last about 500 million years before the sun uh, becomes bright, brighter and the Earth becomes like Venus. And then eventually, of course, five billion years, the Sun becomes red giant and the Earth is toast. Uh, so, uh, you know, they don't last forever. Uh, nothing lasts forever. And neither the Earth nor Mars. But 100 million years is a long time. And that's okay. Other questions? Any other questions? Right here. Not Enceladus. So this question has got nothing to do with tonight's theme. Thank you for asking it. Uh, today, NASA made a very interesting announcement that hydrogen, H2, was confirmed in the plume of Enceladus. Enceladus is a small moon of Saturn. Uh, it has a plume of water coming out of its south pole, cracks in the ice. We've known that it has organic matter and carbon dioxide and ammonia. And now we know it has hydrogen. And that's very interesting because methanogens, a type of microorganisms that many have speculated, including myself, could live in the ocean of Enceladus, eat hydrogen. So this is clear evidence that such an ecosystem could be supported on Enceladus. In fact, the biggest puzzle is why there's so much hydrogen coming out. It's like walking into a nursery room or a kid's play school room and seeing candy on the table. It shouldn't be there. The kids should have eaten it all, right? The hydrogen in this plume is at such high levels that the biggest question, the first question that occurred to me is, why aren't those methanogens busy eating it? Uh, well, there's some explanations of why that might be the case, uh, but it's, it does show that that plume is, that ocean is, is, is habitable. And so Enceladus, I think, has overtaken Mars as the leading candidate for where we should search for life. Does that diminish interest in Mars? Not really, because the Mars story is so much richer in terms of the potential for human exploration and the potential for a habitable biosphere. It can be a world like Earth. And that was the point of that landscape of Yellowknife Bay. Enceladus may have an interesting microbial, methanogen-based ecosystem inside it that will be fascinating to scientists that are fascinated by it, but it will never be 
another broad story of life and humans and uh, like Mars can be. So I'm interested in that. In fact, uh, I have been working nonstop the last year on a proposal to go to Enceladus. Uh, and uh, it's due in a week and a half. So you might say, why am I here? <laughs> Well, it's for comic relief. You can't work on proposals 24 hours a day. You just go nuts. So, uh, plus there's a lot of people working on it. I don't have to work on it. I'm the PI. So there. <laughs> uh, okay, any other off-the-wall questions? Right here. Right. So the question, as I understand it, is we have sent microbes to Mars. They're experiencing radiation, which will trigger mutations, which will alter them. What's going to happen? This is true, but there's one important point. They're not reproducing. So, not yet. That's right. That's right. That's the, that is the big point. Let's go back to that picture. Here they are. Uh, all, this is where half a million Earthlings are living. They are being bombarded with radiation. They're still viable, but they're not reproducing. Uh, right now, this is a so what story. Nobody cares. They're just going to sit there, and if nothing happens, they will all be killed by the same radiation in about 10,000 years. So if we do nothing, it'll all go away. But if we were to warm up Mars and bring the water back, that water would sweep into that rover, and those microorganisms would start reproducing. So that's why this issue of Contamination is important. It's important if you have a vision of Mars that's a biological future because that stuff becomes inoculum if, you don't, if you're not careful. So if you find that there's a second genesis of life on Mars, you've got to get rid of all these Earth bugs, every single one of them, before you push the button. If there's no Mars life, then it's okay then we've already got inoculum there, let them grow, uh, and nature will take its course. So it, these are real issues, and it's what I alluded to in the beginning, the question of life on Mars in the past, the questions of humans uh, on Mars now, and the question of Mars as a biological world in the distant future are all interlinked. Uh, and you have to look at the whole story and think about the whole story. What do we want Mars to be like in the future when we do things like contaminate it? Uh, so yeah, it, it's a, it's, keep thinking. All right, I think we've run out of questions and we've run out of time. I'm gonna hand the mic back to Tucker.